Growing weary of running from room to room, practicing one-tooth insurance-driven dentistry? Then stay tuned for the latest episode of The Lionhearted, where Dr. Steven Rasner will hand you the blueprint for what many call the gold standard of general practice dentistry. Hi, everyone. Dr. Steve Rasner here. Hope you had a great week. I hope you're off to a great 2022. And thank you for coming back. My numbers have started to uh, rise again in terms of download a podcast. And thank you to my friends from around the globe, especially in the UK and Europe, where somebody over there is downloading the heck out of these podcasts. So thank you. Listen, it's my only barometer of whether you're listening other than the occasional letters I get. So really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Let's get to it. I told you about a month ago that I was going to try to change the format of what I say to you each week to be more of this is how you do this in the hopes that it would help you more and you would like the podcast more. So I'm going to continue that vein and I want to reach back to something I said last week. And you know, I don't rehearse these. I get in front of this Morant's piece of equipment I have here. I think for a half an hour, a little bit about what I want to address, or maybe not a half an hour, maybe 20 minutes, maybe 10. (laughs) I would take some notes during the week of things I want you to hear. And last week I said something that I didn't, you know, rehearse. And I want to make it the title because it has so many implications to this week's podcast. And I'm going to call this week's podcast, You Probably Undervalue What You Are Doing. You probably undervalue the practice you're building, particularly if you follow lion-hearted principles. And if you do undervalue, it affects your fees. It affects your willingness to leave insurance. It affects your changing a protocol to get paid up front because you don't think you can do any of those things. You don't think you should be able to charge significant fees in the top of your profession, which is ridiculous if you are earning it. And you also think the other things I just said about, you know, you can't break from insurance because you're not, what, good enough? Is that the case? I mean, I'm not trying to be confrontational. I'm trying to get inside your head on purpose because it it bothers me. I know some of you listen to me that are exceptional and could have the same model that I've been able to afford for years. And of course, the hardest one that most of you don't listen to and I'm positive of this, is putting together a policy, or I don't like the word policy, but protocol to get paid up front because it solves so many other problems. So I'm going to give you a little story that happened in my chair this week. I know that you can relate that underscores this thing about undervaluing who we are. When I say that, undervaluing who we are, I'm speaking about these special organizations that I would call lion-hearted dental practices that have put it all together are certainly on the road to putting it all together. So I had a patient in my chair on, I guess, Tuesday. And she has come to us for years. And she's one of those patients that you have that she raises your blood pressure when you see her on the schedule. You can just never really please her. She has gotten into it with your insurance company before. I mean, your insurance department. There's always a question about her bill or something. And if you are a lion-hearted dentist, these things don't happen much to you. And it feels out of water to you when they do, as it did me. If everybody treated my practice the way this patient seems to, I I don't know. I'd really question everything that I've built. I think there's times in my career where maybe it happened more than it has in the last 20 years. But I don't want people getting mad at us 
for things all the time. And so she's in the chair and the procedure is to insert two single unit crowns, two second bicuspids well, bilaterally. The, the second premolar on the lower left and the second premolar on the lower right. I'm saying that to you because we're talking slam dunk easy things. And she's given us a hard time about everything. About this premolar is too small. And it was clearly not too small. We actually took out a calibrator to measure it. We were talking, listen, if it was off, I wouldn't bring up such a story. I'm just trying to give you the picture that I'm sure you've had before of a patient that just probably is like this. That's what you have to remember, by the way, everywhere they go. And as I'm looking at her speaking to me, I'm noticing, but I forgot, that I had restored her aesthetic zone smile years ago. And her smile was very appealing. And I couldn't help it in the middle of her rant saying, did I do that smile? I'm not, I wasn't kidding. I wasn't trying to be smart. I didn't remember. We, trust me, when you do dentistry for 40 some years, you will probably do many nice cases. You're not going to remember that. And, and the best thing ever happens to you is you see a case or a smile. You're not even sure it is prosthetic or natural and you did it. That was the case. So I'm telling you that because maybe that infused me to say what I was going to say. And for the first time, I think ever in my career, I said to her, the point that I made at the end of last week's podcast. I said, you know, I want you to think about something for a minute. If you don't mind, I'm going to say this. Seriously, I sat her up in a chair. I'm sitting in my doctor chair. I'm at a comfortable distance. And I said, I want you to think about something. I'm at the latter stages of my career probably. And I think about things I didn't always think about. And someday I'm not going to be here. And you are going to have to find another dentist. And I'm looking you straight in the eye. And I want you to remember this day. I want you to remember me and this team. The office you walk into, the people that make your appointments, everything. I think that you might misread how hard this is to put together and how special it is. I have to say to you, you know, like I, we try so hard to create an experience. And that's not just putting a crown, two premolars in your mouth. It's everything. We don't fight with our patients. To be quite honest, I'm proud to tell you that our patients, it's obvious. We're really happy to be in this practice because they value us and they know what they're getting. And it doesn't seem to be, you seem like I feel like you group me into all dentistry by the way you react to things. Anyway, I don't know where that got me, by the way. I ended up sending back a premolar, one of the two premolar crowns for reasons I can't really tell you right now. We're not talking the wrong shade. I'm talking about a lab that charges me close to $400 per unit for that crown. We're talking high quality work here, guys. And I'm sure I'm certainly not positive of why I, I sent it back or even what I will change. It was something about to her, it had a concavity in it that didn't fit or something. I, I'm not sure. But the point is, I think a lot of you do undervalue what you might be putting together that's really special. And I'm looking you in the eye right now. For those of you that can't see me, I am telling you with a microphone as loud as I can that if you are following or emulating a lot of the cornerstones that you hear on this podcast or somebody else's podcast that is likewise, like-minded, that tells you there is a market and there will always be a market for a lion-hearted dental practice, for a doctor who never stops training. And he never stops training because he really cares. 
he really wants to be the very best dentist that he can be. Do you understand that not everybody gives a hoot about what I'm, that's a dentist I'm saying, about what I'm saying to you right now? You think all dentists wanna be the best dentist they can be? A lot of dentists are appreciative of being a dentist and take a lot of their hard earned income and are much better at it than you and I are perhaps and invest in things better than I ever did and accumulate sizable amounts of wealth. And maybe the fervor is not there because of that. I really don't know. You know, I sometimes sit back and I do. Do you ever do this? I sit back and I'm, for God's sakes, once in a blue moon, I do a filling, a direct chair side composite restoration that I make pittance on. Do you, when you do those, do you, do you do those less, with less passion and less attention to detail because you're not making as much on a one surface buckle? I had a patient in my chair the other day that I had to, this is, you're gonna love this. Steve Brasner, who teaches dentist implant dentistry and pretty high level extraction protocols and grafting. From all over the United States and even abroad, they come as observers. That guy was doing a distal buckle on the maxillary second molars. Okay, I, I couldn't believe that that actually ended up in my schedule. Maybe it was a brand new patient, I think it was actually, that really wanted me to do everything. There was a, a crown or two involved but all I can remember is trying to have access and vision to restore on number, how they say across the pond, I believe you would call it one seven and two seven on the distal, not on the mesial, but the distal. So everything was through a mirror and I worked harder to make those restorations even more flawless. I mean, there's, I think you either are excellent or you're not. I don't think you do great implant dentistry and really crappy fillings is my point. So I don't want you to undervalue if you're building this kind of organization. I think it's important to step back and realize those of you that have put in or are putting in the work, the lifetime work that's required, it is so much. You really deserve to run your practice in a way that maximizes your joy and your standard of living because it's really not an easy way. And so, I, I'm, I say this to you with my voice like this, with such passion, because I did this too. I did charge appropriate fees for many of the last several, I don't know how long, most of my career. I always felt guilty about it though. That's the truth, and I don't anymore. I don't anymore because I really am at the end of my career. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but 10 years, I don't know, maybe not, maybe less. And I'm thinking about what I did create, how much I care, how, my, how often, and I'm saying this not because I'm, I'm great, I'm saying it because I want you to recognize it earlier, that maybe if you do, you will appreciate what you're putting together more than you presently are. You know, I listen to, how, I do, I can't help it. I walk past my front desk department and my private office is literally across the corridor and I can hear and see everything when my door is open. And if I, I do, I find myself all the time, I bet you some of you do this, and I say, oh, who are you just talking to? Was that a new patient? Or I heard you take that call on a patient, they were canceled. I didn't hear you reschedule them. Or I hear a patient I do hear patients sometimes questioning their bill. I mean, they always question their bills, do they not? 
Well, yeah, it's true they don't if they pay you 100% up front. And I want that patient to be placated and properly treated and not, even if they are not the most cordial people at that time. So my point is, is a lot goes in to putting together, uh, in any business, by the way, not just ours. So let me get to the specifics for this week that I'm not sure I was specific at the end of the fee discussion last week. And that is, there's no way you can just listen to me and just, what are you going to do? Go back and pull out your fees and just mark them up? It's probably not the way to do this. So I told you last week that there was a Tom Lamoli who, again, I don't even know if he would know who I am. His father knew who I was. I did use his services. Now, there may be, in today's day and age, because it's been a while since I used his services, you should Google services that will provide a fee structure to start with in your particular community. I mean, it's a starting point, is it not? How do you know right now? How do you know what the worst practice in your community, or I don't even know what that would, how you would define that, or the best practice is charging for a crown, a denture, an implant. How do you really know that? Now, maybe I'm being very naive, my friends, and there's a lot of services that do that these days. Now, I'm not telling you to do that, to charge what they're charging, but you do need a starting point. And then if you are creating what you believe is the special practice that I allude to each and every week, well, then I would begin the process uh, and I would have a, a meeting. Now, do you, do you know how to hold a meeting? I've talked about it on many other podcasts. I'll tell you uh, the Cliff Notes way to have a meeting. I would tell you, and if you're not meeting, and I don't mean in the morning, I mean either every two weeks or monthly. This is what I would do if I was a young dentist. I would meet every two weeks. I would block out time during the day, obviously first when you first get to the office because you could be off on time and it's more unpredictable and you end up canceling these meetings. So if you start the day with a meeting for one hour, I think one hour is plenty. And what you do is you, you block out on a calendar for three months. This is what I would do if I was you. And I would track after three months if it made a difference. I don't know how it could not make a difference. See, you may be having meetings in the wrong way. And that's why they're not productive for you. And I know it's not appetizing to tell you to have it during productive time. But believe me, there's no other way to do it because I've tried them all. I've tried them after work. I've tried them on the weekdays we're not working on a Friday. Uh-uh. Everybody will have a reason they can't make it, and it probably isn't the right way to do it. You have to eat the fact that you're not going to have production for one hour every two weeks. And I would, in the beginning, I would have them every two weeks. But you go into that with a written agenda of what you're going to talk about. And of course, we're talking about your fees right now. And why you do that is because you need to have everybody on board. You need to have your dental assistant team to be confident and feeling strong that they work in a practice that charges more than anybody else in your community for whatever else you're providing because you're earning it. I mean, can we stop the, you know what, right now? Can we stop pretending that every business is not the same? That when you go to a restaurant, you're willing to a really nice five-star restaurant or hotel or plastic surgeon or heart doctor or whoever it is. There are people, and many of them, particularly when it comes to the oral cavity, that are willing to pay more for excellence. And excellence is defined by a multitude of things not just your click care, but it starts with your care and it extends over to the team around you. In my case, 
that several clinicians, dental assistants, dental hygienists, you can't have five-star service if you're the only five-star doctor and everybody else is three stars. That's not a five-star business. Or even if you're all clinically gifted, but your front desk team, your reception team, came from a governmental institution like the Motor Vehicles in the United States or a state-run agency, I'm sorry, that often don't give a crap because they get paid what they're getting paid and they have a million benefits regardless of their performance. It, did you ever go to motor, motor vehicles in the United States? For those of you listening in the U.S. prefer a traffic ticket or, oh my God, you feel like you're in a foreign, foreign country, a third world country. That's what I mean. So I guess that's one of Steve Rasner's uh, weaknesses. I get on rants. But it bothers me if you are building the special thing and you're not getting the credit that you deserve for it or running it and enjoying it the way. You're not enjoying your practice to its maximum limit if, you, if you're if you participating in insurance. So the way you do these things and get out of these things, and, and I've said this before, is you have meetings. And very few of you will do this because I, I even I find it hard. And by the way, in the beginning of your meetings, you should have your whole team there. Bring the whole team. You're paying the whole team, by the way. I used to sit in a room and look around for years, by the way. I didn't do it for like one year. At somewhere between 15 and 20 mem staff members of mine. And you'll know who's tuned out and you'll know who you don't have to invite to the next meeting in a matter of one or two or three meetings. I didn't learn that for years, by the way. But that's an important point. I mean, if somebody, if you're getting body language or somebody's looking at their phone, I mean, it's not a difficult assessment to make. And I know I'm going on things here. I started out by telling you about undervaluing your practice. And what I'm trying to do right this minute is tell you, well, literally how do you address your fees? And I said to you, you just can't write them on a piece of paper and hand them to the front desk team and say, that's our new fees. That's not the way to do it. Everybody needs to be on board. And I would ask the question and I'd look everyone in the eye and say, does everybody feel great about the fee structure I'm talking about, because that is going to enable us to do a lot of things, use the best supplies, the best labs, have the best equipment. That's, what do you think? Who's buying this stuff if it isn't you? Who deserves it more than you? If you're really building this unique thing that I come on this podcast with each and every week, I know I sound angry this week because I am. Because I, I really want you to benefit the way you should benefit if you've earned it. If you're on the way, you're not all the way there yet, you still should benefit. Maybe you're not going to benefit as much as those of you that have been doing this and have it down cold for years. Yeah, I'd be glad to give you advice. And the only way to get to do these, this metamorphosis of a change of this practice maybe that used to take insurance and see 25 patients a day and have people coming in at the front desk and slapping down an old their dental bill and arguing with you and, I don't know, have crowns falling out. You get the picture. That's a real picture some, somewhere in our industry. Well, that's not most of you, I assure you, or you wouldn't be listening to this podcast. And I also know, and you know it's true, there are many of you that have this excellent organization that you've built by listening to many, many fine mentors. And you're not maximizing the benefit of it because you're fearful. So remember, where would you go? You, doctor, listening. Team members, if your doctor allowed you or tuned you into my podcast and you didn't have your organization, right? You wouldn't go down the hallway anymore and have Valerie, your hygienist of 30 years, clean your teeth. 
You'd have somebody different for the first time. Then you would go to an office for the first time. I want you to picture this because it's a way to instill confidence in you to warrant all these things I'm saying right now. If you had to go somewhere different, each and every one of you, to get your dental care, not the office that you've worked in for the last 5, 10, or 15 years, but a new office, do you, how easy or how commonplace do you think you are? I bet you're not. I bet you might have to go out of town. I think I would definitely have to go out of town to find an organization that I trusted clinically, everything. I mean, I like Walt Disney clean when I walk into a, a business. And I like state of art. I like current. I like everything counts to me. And I can't help it. I notice when it's not. And I believe that is exactly the case in the industry of dentistry as well, that people have eyes and see, and see what I see. And I'm telling you, as I've told you many times, that I practice in an area of the United States that doesn't even have, they just started getting Starbucks. There's not even a movie theater in the one town my, I, I practice in a county of three towns. There's not even a movie theater in two of the three towns. And so upscale markets type of things don't exist there. But I've been there. And I've thrived there. Thrived, not just made it by for the last 41 years. So clearly... There's a market for it in every place in the United States if you could do it in my area. So you gotta decide how worth it, how valuable you are before you're able to take that leap and chase a practice that's fee for service, before you chase a practice that gets paid the money that you deserve. You know what, I want you to remember something. It's not about if you knew me or you know me now from these podcasts, it's not about getting paid what you deserve so that you can drive the nicest car. I wish I could show you my car that I drive right now. It's a 15-year-old 160,000-mile Lexus with dents all over it. I'm not even kidding. I certainly have the power to go out and buy almost anything I want when it comes to an automobile. So it's not about that. Actually, the more successful financial your practice is, the more benevolent you can be. I throw in free stuff every single day to my patients. And it is the outcome of not running a practice that is run on a shoestring, a budget. It's not because we do so many other things correctly because we've earned the ability to do it correctly. Or getting paid up front, which I think is the hardest thing for all of you to absorb because it is such a foreign concept to, to so many dentists. And again, I have blogs on so many of these things I talk about. I came in here today with the intention of telling you, extrapolating on that one line I made last week, which was, the focus of my podcast, my editor put that out there and I'm going to ask him to do it again. Remember, I think a lot of you undervalue what we do each day. Those of you that have worked the way that I allude to in these podcasts, that worked hard to put together a special team. So let me say one thing about that and I'm going to close on this. This thing started, this talk we've had for the last two weeks because I was reading you some emails that I've get from around the globe and I talked about a dentist that kept his fees the same for a couple of years and now he was feeling it and he was losing the joy. And I got into talking about fees. I mean, there's no bulletproof thing, I have to tell you that. You have to take the leap of faith and if you're way off, there's a way to get caught up with where you should be fee structure wise 
over a period of a couple of years, and a couple of years goes by really quickly. Will you lose patients when you may, uh, raise your fees? Absolutely. I never made. I never put out a letter that made this big announcement like I was told you should do. We're raising our fees by eight percent because the cost of overhead has risen severe. Hell no. I just did it. Yeah, I just did it. And I did it many times, about every other year for many years. Now, I haven't raised my fees in several years, by the way. No, well, that's not true. I did it three years ago. But that was the first time in about three years. So if you want guidance on this, those of you that have paid the price and earned it, you can pick up the phone and, or email me first and we can pick up the phone and have that conversation. But... I went here with you because I think, and I realize it's kind of I'm pontificating because I'm, I, I, I think you know why, because I, I care about you and I want you to, to realize the special thing that you're creating. That's all. But I was going to speak to you about one of the other letters I had in an email. I'm going to do it next week. And it's about the climate we're in right now with staff. And the staff member, this person was commiserating with me about the fact that they had a staff member that asked for a, you know, five hour plus an hour raise, which I understand is a, I hear all kinds of things going on right now in our industry because like all industries, there's a lack of available staff. So doctors are doing everything from giving gigantic raises that we never gave before or giving sign on bonuses or all these things because they're desperate and they really want a person and a body there. Well, let me tell you one more benefit of being the Four Seasons Hotel of dental practices, if you will. You don't have to bend. People wanna work for you. People aren't going to hold you hostage. In general, they're not, because they'd rather be part of a five-star organization Th then And I'm not telling you you can't pay them at the top of the profession, but right now, let's be honest with each other, the industry's changed in the last year since COVID. And a lot of doctors are being held hostage. And I think I'm going to address that next week about how you should handle that. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Have a great week. Please reach out to me. It means a lot when I hear from you, and a lot of you are. Have a great week. See you next week on The Lionhearted.